Learn Sphere and Data Shop are the result primarily of NSF grants. Um, Data Shop was funded originally by a Science of Learning Center that I directed from about 2004 to 2014, which did a lot of things, uh, including a lot of ed tech uh, embedded experiments in, in uh, blended tech-enabled courses, um, including our cognitive tutors and open learning initiative and so forth. But part of that uh, Learn Lab Center effort was to create a data repository and that, that was Data Shop. And then after that, we, we got to NSF Cyber Infrastructure Funds to, uh, to extend out uh, the data infrastructure um, in LearnSphere, and I'm showing the LearnSphere.org page, which you're welcome to go to yourself, um, which is that effort towards expansion. And part of the pitch for LearnSphere was to say, we've got a lot of data silos um, like Data Shop, which is primarily clickstream level data. Um, and then we have MOOCDB as an MIT effort, the, uh, which was about MOOC data, tended to be at a longer time scale. Uh, we have discourse uh, data from things like uh, chats and discussion boards on online courses. Um, and so another effort is around that kind of data. Uh, data Stage is a Stanford uh, effort. Um, uh, University of Memphis uh, has done a number of things, both with language data um, and with other kinds of practice environments. I don't know if Phil Pavlik's on the line, but Phil, I see, is in the notes as having attended before, and he's a part of this project and has done work on, on bringing detailed cognitive models of uh, of, of, of learning and memory and transfer over time to bear in, in optimizing uh, the selection of activities for students. Um, so LearnSphere is bringing those resources together. Um, a key integrating tool is this Tigris workflow tool, which uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second, but I thought I'd first go to data shop and uh, but before I go there, one thing to note is part of LearnSphere has been an effort to make it possible for anybody to put up an instance of, of, of LearnSphere and its Tigris tool at their own location. And, and what I'm showing here is, is for those locations. And analogously, uh, the way at the same time you get Data Shop at your location. So I can click here and, and go to Data Shop at CMU. And, and this is the effort that was supported by the Science of Learning Center. Um, which was a big effort. I think the, the data shop effort was about 600,000 US dollars uh, per year over that 10 year period. So um, a lot of work um, and uh, a lot of activity. Like if I click on this metrics report, just to illustrate um, how much data is here, uh, we see uh, 1,598 different data sets. Um, Hello, yeah. uh, Ken, sorry. Yeah. Um, are you changing your screen? We didn't see it change. Oh, really? Uh, We're still on the workshops page, which I think you originally loaded. Aha. Uh -huh. The workshops page. All right. That's not good. Um, maybe I should try clicking new share or or just stop share and then share again. Um, did this change anything? Not yet. Okay. Um, how do I stop share? There it is, okay. Share. Apologies, N not a super expert at Zoom here. Um, Oh, I, I see. If I share my desktop, that'll probably work better. Um, yeah, you may have been sharing one browser window. And yeah, right. The wrong one. Uh, do you see the, the chat there on the desktop? And now I just yes. dragged in the Learn Lab yeah. screen. Yeah. We, see your whole, we see your whole desktop. OK. Um, so. There's the LearnSphere site, and 
sorry when I was pointing earlier, probably weren't seeing, but here are these instances of data shop and, and, and essentially learn sphere at these different locations, CMU, Memphis, Stanford, Tudor Gen, um, the company, uh, and, and we are open to industry involvement. Uh, can you see now this uh, data shop at CMU page? Yes. And this is the metrics report showing nearly 1,600 data sets from, uh, we have algebra, chemistry, Chinese, English, French, geometry, physics, statistics. These represented domains during the, the Learn Lab Center that we were doing specific efforts in. But you can see that uh, some 1,000 of these data sets, 500 other and, and 526 unspecified are in other areas. There are online courses, intelligent tutoring systems, uh, educational games, a huge variety of things. Um, and if you see the menu over here, you can click on upload a data set and uh, open up a project and upload a data set. Uh, uh, and when you do that, um, and there's lots of documentation up here in the help about how to, what data shop is, how to get data in and so forth. Um, then you get access to a whole bunch of online uh, learning analytic tools that are described uh, here in, in, uh, in, in, the, um, in the help pages. Uh, but I could uh, perhaps show you some of those tools, um, but I'm also open, you know, if people have questions about uh, data format for upload, happy to go in that direction as well. Uh, um, one of our cognitive tutors for high school math was in the geometry area, uh, geometry, uh, mathematics um, uh, content area. Um, and this is a unit in that uh, cognitive tutor on uh, the area of geometric figures, data from student interaction with, with such. And then the help pages, you can see an example of, of of those kinds of interactions and and what they look like um, and this learning curve tool is one of the tools that is available another one is a performance pro profiler tool uh, which which shows uh, aggregated data kind of like a pivot table uh, um, like error rate at the problem level or at the step level or at the student level um, mm -hmm or at the knowledge component level. Uh, there's an error report uh, which shows for each activity what are the common student answers, correct and incorrect, uh, um, that's, that's shown here. And then finally, um, export is different kinds of ro roll up of the most detailed transactional level, every essentially every click in the graphical user interface and the and the response from, from the online uh, tutoring system. So lots of columns here. Uh, or there are, I didn't mean to switch pages there. Um, or there are finer, uh, uh, more aggregated uh, um, at the step level summary data, like how many answers did this student try before getting it correct, or how many hint messages did they request. Um, and then summary at the problem level. So you can ex export that and uh, do your own analytics offline um, if, if you want. Um, but these online tools are meant for you know, any analyst, um, a course developer, instructor, um, researcher, can, can run these kinds of analytics uh, without uh, needing to do any programming. So that was part of the effort is to make analytics more generally available. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's my quick overview of uh, uh, of Data Shop. I could show you a little bit more about LearnSphere, but I, I guess I'll say that you know if you want to find out more, in addition to this online written documentation, there are a set of videos that give kind of demo walkthroughs of uh, this one's exploratory analysis with Data Shop. I think if you go to that, you'll, you'll, you'll find links to other YouTube videos on other topics, like how to do Bayesian 
how to apply a Bayesian knowledge tracing algorithm to your data, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll pause for a second, see if you have any, any questions about this. Yeah, they are actually um, pretty complex modeling under the hood. And uh, you can find data model sheet at the depth link, links at the depth. Yeah, there's definitely some, uh, there is, uh, I guess when I was flashing up the learning curve, uh, um, you, you, uh, uh, you might have noticed both uh, a kind of red jagged line and a somewhat smoother blue line. I'll try to bring that back up. Um, that's, uh, um, I guess we're going to a Chinese, that the red is actual student error rate over opportunities to practice. This is a data set of learning Chinese and, and, and there's knowledge components with respect to the five different tones um, and the different syllables uh, here written in, uh, uh, of course, not with Chinese symbols, but in, in English. Um, and the blue line hiding, hiding underneath is a, is a growth model generalization of item response theory, um, if you know that connection to psychometrics. Uh, or another way to think about it is it's a logistic regression um, with parameters for student uh, for knowledge component uh, starting point and for the rate of learning across different knowledge components. And part of what this, we use this tool for is to uh, help you analyze whether your cognitive model is, is a good chunking up of the knowledge in the domain. Um, and this page of knowledge component models shows a kind of leaderboard of different efforts to take what are some 12,000 different items in this Chinese uh, um, language learning uh, course unit um, uh, as though there were one knowledge component that model does not fit very well uh, two five six seven uh, here's one with 17 here's one with 35 this kind of makes it look like uh, more knowledge components is better but the item model notices the worst so what we all, uh, often find here is there's a kind of uh, intermediate sweet spot where the grain size of the skills in the domain, if you will, um, is, is kind of optimized in terms of learning and transfer. Um, but you, what you can do here is export a table and then relabel the data with an alternative cognitive model, then, or, or we call it a knowledge component model, and then re-import it, and then all these uh, analytics will be done automatically, cross-validation, AIC, DIC, and you'll get a new, you'll, your model will get paste, placed in this leaderboard. So this is an, a great way, like if you, if you put your data set up here, um, other, others can do analysis from it and you might benefit from their results essentially. And conversely, if you have an analytic routine that you wanna test, um, you can test it out um, on these data sets. Um, we've had lots of uh, folks look across multiple data sets to try out new kinds of analytics. So that's data shop. Uh, um, any any questions about that? You're not dealing with any personal information, right? Or sorry, student personal information, right? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, um, clickstream data is uh, you know relatively speaking. Uh, um, easier to uh, de-anonymize, I mean, anonymize, de-identify, and, and we go through a lot of effort um, and, you know, have uh, IRB uh, both oversight on what we do, but you'll, you will see if you, if you want to uh, import data um, into DataShop, uh, you'll need to indicate whether you have an I or B, and if you don't, then we won't share it with anybody but you, so it'll be completely private. Uh, if you do have an I or B and it's of the right character, then it can be made either public or shareable, and the notion of shareable is, uh, is, is essentially reflected in, if you look at the list of all these data sets, you'll see, well, these are the ones, these are my data sets, but if I go to private data sets, some are, completely private, 
for example, because they have not been uh, uh, vetted as being shareable. Some are shareable in private, and the shareable and private ones will have this request access button. So if you want to ask Bruce McLaren whether you can look at his data from, I think this is a decimal, like an educational game for learning about decimals and his multiple data sets about it. You can click this request access button, write him a little email message, you know, Bruce, Bruce, can I take a look at your data? He'll get that message and can decide whether he wants to share it with you. So, it, you know, if you have a data set and you want, you want to kind of monitor who's looking at it, um, that's the way you can do it. And you can say, yeah, I'd love to find out what you do with my data uh, and, and return your results. That sort of thing. There's a whole bunch of documentation here about how different kinds of course developers, educational technology researchers can use this data. We should probably add learning engineer to this list, huh, Cindy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, we haven't updated this in a number of years, but this points to a whole bunch of other documentation. So Ken, what, what, do, you, what do you see, if any, relationship between the data shop and Caliper and XAPI? Because it looks it looks like your data structure there is tidy data. You have TSV and XML. I mean, do you see um, a method of connecting XAPI or Caliper to Data Shop as an importation or streaming? Totally. Model? Yeah. Um, when people have uh, produced data from various systems, like here's a data set from Alex. Uh, there is a translation process that needs to be done to get it into this format and uh, um, that uh, there is an XML uh, import port format and there's a, a, a denormalized great big table you know uh, 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 like a, a, a comma separated table uh, format as well that uh, we could go from a specified XAP X API format to this format as a standard uh, import routine. Mm -hmm. That's actually maybe a good segue to LearnSphere. Um, what we're trying to do with LearnSphere is open up the back end a bit more, you know, where the, here there's access to, you know, easy access to different already preloaded analytics. In LearnSphere, we want to allow the community to, to, to jointly develop out a whole set of analytic tools which will populate this workflow men method menu over here on the left. Um, and here we have various ways of importing MOOC data or other online course data, but one of these imports could be an XA, XAPI for mm -hmm. format import, right? Which then would potentially get transformed into uh, other potential formats. And, and, uh, you know, the idea with this is that you can uh, build a workflow by dragging these components out and reconfiguring them in various ways. This particular workflow is an example from an analysis we did of a psychology MOOC where we had all the detailed clickstream data from interacting with the MOOC and the online resources, video watching, uh, clicking on pages, answering questions, and then we had their final outcome data and this workflow links the two together and then does some regression modeling to show which kinds of learning resource uses are most predictive of student learning outcomes. And, and surprise, surprise, it's the learn by doing uh, kind of activities that are most predictive and video watching and, and text reading is, is much less so. But the idea is that uh, you know, if you want to do this kind of analysis with data formatted in a different way, then, you know, like an XAPI format or a Caliper format, then you could create some kind of import or translation off to the left here, right? That would then hook it into all the right, all the rest. Does that that's make pretty, sense? Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So a couple follow-up questions then. Uh, what is the procedure for getting such an importer set up? Is, 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 that, is this open source for other people to write these importers? Or is this yeah, um, on these... Uh, that these gear boxes are both, uh, if when you build a component, you can build a little options GUI, like for these import components, this is actually a menu into all the data in data shop. 
Uh, but the down here we see the GitHub link. So this mm. component's code is on GitHub. So you know, if you wanted to see how this import worked and edit it for your purposes, you could go view it on GitHub and then edit it. Um, we are just releasing at the tomorrow. <laughs> Cindy's here, the lead software engineer. There'll be a new re release of tomorrow of Learn Sphere that that has a a, a kind of a component building uh, script. Um, currently, building components involves uh, you know more back end uh, things, but we're trying to make it so that you can take this component that you might have written in R or uh, or Java or Python or whatever different language, right, and then integrate it into this environment. Uh, the LAC workshop we did was to help uh, teach more people about how to do uh, how to build components, but we're also trying to make that easier through GUIs. I see that we're up to time here, but here, it, this, this is uh, the workshop we did recently, and there's more information about how to create components available online. But we, you know, we'd love to engage this community and. In, in, in contributing to and benefiting from LearnSphere and DataShop. So th thanks so much for your time. I hope this was useful and happy to take further questions uh, offline uh, as, as desired. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, I think we only touched the service of this tool set. And um, one of the topic of this SIG is to build a learning analytics connector. So uh, we will want to have SAP data set to connect to your tool set. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. And if somebody has some XAPI data, uh, you know, we Cindy and Steph could help with uh, writing that translator. Uh -huh. uh, Desired. I, you know, I think the the way we want to get started is just to see a concrete example of of some data that in you know whether it's Caliper or XAPI format, um, and and then we could you know illustrate how to do it. Maybe even write a, a first pass at such a component. Yes. Yes. So that's great. And um, I I can um I can get some SAPI data from uh, our partners. And also, if others can get SAP data set, or are welcome. And yeah. um, it, the the this topic group uh, is uh, led by Johnson, and we should start the meeting very soon. And we have and we already have Cindy uh, join us to help us with this topic. This is topic three. Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and also uh, people from U Memphis involved in this. I think it's introduced by Ken. Yeah, uh, I think these are the the Memphis folks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, like I said, now that I have uh, some support, I'll uh, I'll send an email out to get this conversation going. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so, any other question? I have more. I have, I have more questions, but I don't know if you want to end the meeting. I can. I can message Ken offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, we we should set up a meeting time for this group as soon as possible. To continue the, the the work. Yeah, I have a a question and types in the chat, and for Professor Ken. So oh, if okay. you, uh, so after meeting, so. Uh, if you feel okay, um, please tell yeah, me. Yeah, actually, I, um, Cindy are, uh, and I are scheduled to meet next. I just noticed, so showing you my complicated camera, my calendar. But uh, yeah, I can. T <laughs> okay. I'm happy to stay online if uh, for a while if folks want to ask ask some more questions here. Yeah, that works for me. Okay. Okay. Go for it. So you start, or do you want to officially end the meeting? Uh, Should we so stop the recording?
Oh. I'd say keep it going in case people okay. <laughs> want to hear the other questions. Okay. Questions, Q and A. Okay. So uh, anyone need to jump? Just feel free to leave. Uh, hey, so Jesse, um, this is Peter. Um, <clears throat> there was some uh, chat asking, <clears throat> excuse me, asking for an example of a decision tree, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have the the file, the the um, example up, you know, the one that you sent out. Um, I don't have it anywhere on a web location, but um, what's the best way for us to get it to people that don't have it? Um, can we upload it to Slack? Oh, Slack. Okay. Oh, don't, don't we have a Google Drive now? Can we put it in there? Oh, oh yeah, 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 we have Google Drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can, can we put files in there or is it just you? Yes, yes, we can put files into the Google Drive. Yeah. Okay. So we have permissions. Okay. okay. Thank you, Peter. So Q&A for Ken. Yeah, go for it. Right. So I'll, I'll jump in because I'm anxious. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, is this John? Yeah, this is John. John's okay. uh, Kevin. Ken, you, you briefly mentioned um, R when you were talking earlier. Is that, what, is that what's running the statistical analysis in the background? No, um, that, the, the cool thing about Tigris is that we're integrating through uh, the, uh, a generic table of uh, data flow here to components that are written in any language. Um, so some of these components are written in R, um, like this Python implementation of, it, it is written in Python of a lo logistic regression on learning uh, growth model. Um, what else we have? Uh, written in C, C++. C++. Uh, yeah, so any language, but um, yeah. The Tetrad ones are um, actually running a jar. Like oh, yeah. Tetrad is this uh, um, causal inference, pretty sophisticated set of causal inference mm -hmm. analytics that mm -hmm. uh, some other folks here at CMU developed. And they, they have a desktop application, but we worked with them to take all of the back end code and, and now make it into components that are available here, you know, again. In the uh, yeah, so, so so far we haven't met a language we didn't like. <laughs> uh, okay, so it, it's uh, so some of this is, some of the actual analysis components are built by you guys and some are somewhat crowdsourced. It, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that's what like, like the lack workshop was about getting more folks to contribute new uh, new components. Like there was the. There was a data analyst from Summit Schools, for example, who, who wrote a new component uh, there. Yeah, and a lot of these components that exist now are coming from different, different sources. Of course, a good number of them from, from us. Uh, but, uh, so after, uh, so I, I, I love the visualization. It reminds me of my old 3D days and the hypergraph in, in Maya. I don't know if anybody else is familiar with that, but it looks cool. So when you, when you get through your, your, your flow here, the output I'm assuming is a data set out of the learn sphere? Um, the output of each component is displayed here. And, and this is kind of left to right. The leftmost component is producing a table that's being passed on. Um, here is uh, some, both a transformation, a column added to that table, it's new predictions, mm -hmm. and some of the logistic regression output model values in a second table. And then a third table of, of these are essentially, if you know, these are the log logistic regression uh, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. parameter estimates. So they're, each skill has an intercept and a slope. Each student has an intercept. These are in log odds units um, as in logistic regression. And then as you move uh, further to the right, you, there might be visualization mm -hmm. outputs mm -hmm. here. One of our broader goals is to to have the kind of visualizations be look a little more integrated with the the like the view and the controller like you saw in data shop all on the same screen mm -hmm. and right now they're separate like you know you see these these are similar learning curve images but if i want to go and compare this learning curve this is the, these blue lines are one learning curve statistical model and then this version 2 is a different one um, One's Bayesian knowledge tracing and one's this logistic regression additive factors model. And then I think this one's 
an additive factors model with a slip parameter in it. Um, and you know, right now it's a little bit tricky to compare the blue lines across these, but you know, here if I do this, you can see uh, the data staying the same and the model predictions are changing. Uh, yeah, but, but again, the, the idea of LearnSphere isn't to give these visualizations, but to let the community, not just to give them, but to let the community build new and better ones. Yeah, that's cool. I, I use uh, D3 for a lot of the visualizations we do at the University of Hawaii. So it'd be interesting to see how that might merge in here. Yeah, right. And in, in integrating D3 visualizations into here would, would be certainly possible. I've got one already that someone has contributed, but it's a very specific application. Mm -hmm. And visualizations are definitely the tier that needs, that has the fewest number of um, yeah, as you can yeah. see. One is our standard learning curve that he showed you, and then there's a that D3 force is one that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, force there. Okay. But it's very specific to their application. So we have a to do list item to make a general purpose D3 visualization. Yeah, as you can see here, if you do make a contribution, you know, your authorship will be indicated here in the rollover. And, and, and part of, you know, we want to make. We want to make bragging rights as um, <laughs> powerful as possible. So, you know, we're, if people have other suggestions about how to highlight their contributions, we're wide open to that. That's cool. I, I don't think it's, it's not surprising uh, that you don't have a lot of visualizations yet. The majority of your participants are probably researchers and statistical and ed psych type people. I feel like that's what's uh, been the exact opposite for XAPI is it's almost all developers and coders and, uh, there hasn't been enough learning science and ed psych and data people yet. So uh, I, I look forward to maybe a, a nice merger here to, to, to bridge the gap. Yeah, yeah. And, and it would be great to indeed. So um, actually, we can contribute SAPI dashboard to here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how to start doing that? Probably the importer is the first step, yeah. Uh, I mean, not, not data set, I mean, SAPI dashboard. Where the, where the dashboard will display? Yes, uh, display uh, SAPI, SAPI data. Uh, so the, imp the input to that is some XAPI file, and the output is some display of the contents of it that's more visual? Yes, to display SAPI data. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so that might be a two-component workflow where there's the there's an import for the XAPI data uh -huh. um, that, that then produces a table, and then that table goes to your to the, your display algorithm. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, uh, if I'm understanding, is, what is the nature of the display? Um, it's the dashboard designed for that SAPI profiles designed. So you uh -huh. can visualize the SAPI granular data. And then and the dashboard has controls on it. So you can, uh, like, uh, for example, I was just going to see. Yeah, you, you can interact with the dashboard. I see. Right. Yeah. Uh, kind of like these controls off to the left here in Data Shop, or I can roll over and change this, yeah. that kind of interaction. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, uh, right now, that's a little indirect, as I was trying to say before, uh, because here you see the output, um, but then you have to go back to the workflow and uh, potentially add, you know, here's the controller. And so this is parameters on this visualization tool. Like if I don't want error bars, I can click this menu. Um, so, you know, the upside of this kind of factoring is that it's easy to uh, integrate new pieces. Mm -hmm. But one downside is that, at least at the moment, the you know where you where you where the controller is, if you know that model view controller notion, and where the view is are currently mm -hmm. separated. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to go to the this to see the view, right? So that's a little cumbersome. But we want to fix that, and you know, and that, and if we build out uh, the open source community more, then then maybe you want to. If you can help fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if we or Jonathan contribute the dashboard to here, then 
you will um, like take the host the code here. Or yeah. You, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we're, we're quite willing to do that. Um, but we're also willing to let others have their own mirror of LearnSphere. Um, you know, LearnSphere at your location. Oh. But then you have to host it. You know, the downside is you have to host it. The upside is if, you know, particular part of that is for like data privacy issues. Like some, yes. you know, I know some, some companies or some countries um, or some states mm -hmm. in the U.S. have some laws about sending student data around. So uh, instead of sending the data around, we can send the infrastructure around. But what we're, you know, we're trying to make that still have a sense for the user of, of everything shared. Yeah. Um, another question is, um, before I say PI, uh, we don't collect so granular data. For example, um, I have looked into your data model and you don't have time span on one behavior. We, did you say we don't have a timestamp? Time span, like oh. how long the learner answer a question, for example. How long uh, will your learner take to answer a question? Right. Yeah, that, that uh, well, I guess there's two things here. There's the data shop format. Uh -huh. um, and in here, every, here, I'm just showing the transaction log. And this is the time at which that transaction occurred, you know, mm -hmm. which was some student on a geometry area problem answered question one um, uh, with a certain entry. And, uh, and it took a certain amount of time which is reflected, the duration here is the elapsed time in this particular format. Uh, but it does get, in, in this kind of data, it's somewhat more straightforward. In, in one of the workflows I showed you earlier from a MOOC, there's some nuances on, you know, you actually tag the time that some event occurs, like you click on a web page. And then, like if it's a web page of reading, they click on the next web page, then you can subtract the two as an estimate of how long they spent on that page, right? Yeah. Um, but those those are start times. With activities, it's when they enter an answer that you get a, uh, a timed uh, event, but that's at the end. So there are some subtleties about uh, inferring duration when in you know one case you get the start of an event and the other case for a different kind of event that follows it's the end and you don't have anything in between you don't want know when they stopped reading the page and yeah. start reading the question if the yeah. question embedded in the page for example so you know that and that's not about the analytics that's about the tool you know whether the tool provides the right level of logging yeah, so uh, I'm curious if we can provide time span on each behavior and will it be possible to be taken into your modeling? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like um, this, this workflow that I showed uh, a while ago, it's take a second to come up. Uh -huh. uh, this particular uh, Open Learning Initiative OLI resource use component is computing the, the number of times and the time spent that students in this MOOC uh, were uh, watching videos. So we get the duration as well as the total duration for each student of video watching, you know, which is made up of each individual duration. The total duration of reading, the total duration uh, um, duration of, of doing. Uh, actually, this table, yeah, is the aggregate of all that, but further to the left are the details. So yeah, that's totally possible. I don't know why it's not coming up at the moment. But. Okay, so uh, actually, um, if we have more granular data, it's actually possible to, uh, to, to, to improve the modeling. Yeah, totally. Um, um, I, Usually people say our data is, is too granular, but uh, uh, I'm so, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I would be surprised if, if, if your data is more granular than we can handle. 
Yeah. I mean, some of these can... components are meant to deal with, like one of the, there are these, uh, uh, this Cronebox Alpha you can apply to a grade book. So that's very coarse grain kind of thing. Okay. Uh, there's no, the, the beauty of this workflow is that there is no global standard. Um, every component in essence, you know, has its own standard, if you will. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, the sort of reuse of these components <coughs> define, in essence, what the community thinks the standard is. Mm. The MOOC and the video one might be an interesting, uh, an interesting one to start with to look at bringing XAPI in, since we have the video profile. So we have an entire profile that, that defines that, and we do have some data that sounds a little more granular than what was explained there, because in the video profile we collect not just how much video an individual student watched, but how many times they rewatched sections of, of the video timeline. The, the goal being to do a heat map to see if certain, certain sections of the video were rewatched for issues. Yeah. yeah, that's the difference between this component uh, in the middle, the OLI resource use is aggregating, mm -hmm. but the data actually in the transaction level log has play and pause and back, you know, and forward. So indeed, That's great. Then, then what we can do then is we can start with getting the XAPI data in uh, and right. then uh, the transformation of that data from the video profile into a structure that will go into this. And then we can just continue the same analysis to just make sure it works, you know? Yeah, you would need the, then I mean, this outcome data is is another path, but this is like the final exam, total quiz score data. Right, right, yeah, assuming there's some sort of assessment there too. Exactly, right. right. Yeah, yeah that, that would be a, a cool one to just get XAPI working with the least amount of other node work <laughs> and just yep. uh, focus on the importing. Yeah, this is really interesting. Sir, how did you get to this one again? Um, LearnSphere.org. Uh, I mean this particular analysis, the MOOC one. What do you, oh, you mean from, from here? This is the doer effect psychology? Oh, or, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that I know how to get back here so I can look at the XAPI stuff, so I see, so all right. So it's from that list, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, and there is a, there's a learning at scale paper in 2015, uh, learning's not a spectator support, that uh, I guess is also rep, uh, referenced here. The regression analysis in that paper is roughly modeled by this uh, doer effect psychology uh, workflow. And then the tetrad causal inference analysis in that paper is, uh, is represented by this workflow. You know, so part of what we're trying to do is to take, you know, written up pieces of analytics and, and, and reveal the, the full uh, analytic process as much as we can. Uh, Ken, who, who do we bug or how do we get into LearnSphere? I tried to log in and create an account and uh, the Shibboleth server at uh, University of Calgary doesn't work with the authentication mechanism. So is there another way in if you're not already a participating organization? Uh, you can... This is you, Cindy. She's yeah. A, yeah. If you have a Google account, you can log in there. If you oh, okay. 24 hours and would prefer, we'll, there's also a LinkedIn option that's coming tomorrow. There's a... Okay. Um, so I would strongly recommend the way we're working with this, not to hunt on anything, but it's going to be better tomorrow. <laughs> um, so if you can possibly wait. Oh yeah, that's fine. Thank you. That's brilliant. You can send an email and I'll make sure you get the release notes when they come out tomorrow around one or 2 PM. Can you not have both? Can I have both what? A LinkedIn login and a Google login, or does that somehow clash? They don't clash, but they will be separate logins. Right, and if you start to work on one, it won't transfer to the other. Right. But it, you know, if, if he wants to go into data, to look you with can the go Google, in today, just don't do anything Google. you want to save. No, okay, and got you, it. We can we can port any access or anything you do for one. Yeah, well, that but we that's not worth migrate. it for twenty four hours. It's not worth it for twenty four hours. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, if. We, and we I, thanks for bringing that up because I think we we have to figure out a way to give better guidance on that because 
yeah, when you, uh, I just, just to illustrate, you know, we've been trying to make, this is one of those things, like it really should be easier to, like we don't want to be innovating on logging in, right? <laughs> um, but surprisingly tricky to make it easy for everybody. Yeah, so. Yeah, but it, so tomorrow there'll be a sign in with LinkedIn. There will be a In the new release that's right. coming out. Um, and it, like, yeah, like I can click on sign in with Carnegie Mellon and, and if you happen to be in this in common list, but lots of people aren't, so. Um, but yeah, if you want to stick your email, if you don't do it today, you want to put your email in the chat, I'll make sure you get the release notes. If you do do it today, then you'll show up on the list of recent users and you'll get the email tomorrow. Okay. Jonathan's got his in. Yeah, that'd be. Great. Um, Cindy, I'll, I'll put you on the release notes. Uh, um, sorry, just, just to go back a little bit earlier again, Ken, can you remind me again um, what instruction or training was there around uh, making the components? I think you said something was coming out, but I, I, I Oh, know. well, we had this workshop, but um, here in the help um, mm -hmm. are some videos on various things like how to use workflows. And here's one on creating workflow components. Um, this is actually pre tomorrow's release where there'll be a slightly somewhat easier or maybe more restrictive way of doing it well in that it is a little bit more form oriented or not yeah tomorrow's will be a, a script that you run you spe you'll specify um, a properties file where you give the metadata for the component that you want to create and a pointer to any supporting um, classes and whatnot. So if you've written it in R, you'll give us a pointer to your R files. Um, and then it'll generate the, the code for you. Um, the videos that are there, they walk through someone taking an existing component and pulling up the files in an editor and changing them to fit their needs. So copy and edit strategy. Unless you're really, um, really wedded to your Emacs, I would hold off for the script for tomorrow and use that to get started. Okay. All right. And but with I, the next I'm, release, we're hoping it'll be a UI based, but. And I, and I guess we'll get a new instructional video out uh, showing how to use this script. I don't know why this one's not showing my limited competence here with. Yeah, so I hope that helps. Yeah, this and, is an awesome tool. Thank you for all your hard work on it. It's great. Yeah, uh, and you know, definitely feel very free to send us message. Uh, Cindy, I, we don't have a email prompt on this page. The help page probably should have a contact us at. Cindy loves to get your email. So, <laughs> um, um, Ken, um, do do you have a uh, the analytic engines that's like a recommendation engines to recommend the best next step for a user like this more uh, user oriented analytics because this or more like a um, for analyst analyst not for user uh, meaning which kind of user a student an instructor yeah, a student. Or a, developer? Yeah. A, a student a student yes. that recommend his best next step. I, I know um, that will be need will be will be needing more thorough data. Right. Uh, well, I, I I guess that that kind of uh, so called outer loop in an intelligent tutor or even in old branching computer aided mastery based instruction kind of approaches uh -huh. are there, there's a whole set of those kinds of you know, activity recommendation uh, algorithms. In our cognitive tutors, you know, we use the knowledge tracing algorithm. Yeah. And, and the skillometer stuff. Um, and there is like the knowledge tracing code, uh, if you look in the right place, is, is now pretty easily available and replicable. Um, you, you have to, you know, you have to build some kind of label level cognitive model uh, mm -hmm. of what the knowledge components in your domain are. But once you have that, then 
you know, this Bayesian update algorithm will, for each student and each knowledge component, say what, what's the probability that they know it. And then uh, I guess the problem selection algorithms that, that use that data um, are, are perhaps less generally available uh, as I'm thinking out loud about that. But uh, that kind of stuff, um, some of that stuff is available through the Cognitive Tutor authoring tools here, CTAT. Yeah. yeah. And with, you know, with CTAT's really an architecture and you can pick uh, different parts of it to make use of and configure it in various ways. But there's, there's logging code, there's GUI development code, there's backend, simple back end, uh, tutoring backend code. And, uh, and there is this, and there is code for doing knowledge tracing and problem selection available yeah. here. That, which is one kind of recommender system. But it, you know, by far not the, not the only, you know, Alex is another system that has a very different kind of rec recommender, uh, if that helps. So, yeah, maybe we, um, we will need a, a, a course for all of these tools. I'm glad you that said that. Cool. Yeah, here, our Learn Lab summer school <laughs> yeah. uh, is accepting applications now. Uh, you can go to learnlab.org and, and find this, and uh, there are tracks for uh, open learning initiative, that's online course development, intelligent tutoring system development, computer supported collaborative learning, and educational data mining. Mm -hmm. um, the ITS development one teaches using uh, how to use uh, CTAT basically. Um, OLI has the open learning initiative development environment for online courses. The, the EDM track uh, uses data shop and uh, learn sphere and and teaches more generally about you know relevant machine learning methods for doing learning analytics you uh, participants get we team them up in a project with two mentors that they work on over the over the week um, and there are there are general lectures as well as track specific lectures uh, and then students uh, do these uh, uh, poster presentations at the end. Uh, this, this, by the way, is just some of the lecture topics along the way and, and some of the student presentations from last year. So um, is it possible to build, to bring that summer school online? Uh, well, uh, Here's a page of online slides, um, and uh, I guess um, I have an e-learning design course uh, that I'm uh, uh, this is it, uh, my Canvas course that we're going to make available at a distance this summer. Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. yeah, so that's another possibility. It'll start at the end of May. <clears throat> Oh, May? Yeah. Oh, so it's August. Uh, uh, we'll, do, we'll do another iteration in August, but, uh, and this uses OLI, so there's uh, modules in OLI uh, on uh, how people learn, instructional complexity, determining instructional goals, and it's backward design stuff, cognitive task analysis, learning by doing principles, multimedia principles, e-learning course design and evaluation. You know, we do some experimentation, A-B testing kind of things here. And then this is all uh, a combination of on, uh, you know, well-specified learning objectives, of course, um, and uh, you know, some online uh, resources, uh, slides, uh, um, some, drag and drop, uh, what's the big picture? Uh, that's gonna be wrong, feedback, right? Uh, yeah, so this, uh, we're gonna make it available over the summer uh, 
with a certificate then and then the possibility of getting CMU credit we're trying to work out with the university how to how to do that but ho hopefully it'll all all the details will be worked out so you will have one starting in May and the other starting in August right uh, yeah uh, I'm only hesitating on I'm, I don't uh, whenever our spring semester starts will be the next one And um, this is not all about adaptive learning or learning analytics. This is more about e-learning design, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right, and we, we're going to, John Stamper teaches a, an e-learning, uh, sorry, a learning analytics uh, course, but we don't, and we're gonna get that online eventually. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just, haven't had the time to do all the hard work. Okay, got it. Great, well, thanks everybody for your attention. I, it feels like we're probably, hard to tell how many are left in the virtual room here, but. Uh, would you like to send us the, the your e-learning design course link in the chat? Eight of us left, oh good. Um, let's see, uh, I believe that, uh, the Learn Lab page oh, okay. has the link to it, but maybe not. I, yeah, I saw that, but I, I saw it, it was, in August. It, yeah, that was probably August of last year. Um, oh, okay. Not yeah, uh. Yeah, we don't have an online application for that available, and partly because we're still waiting for precise guidance from the university about how we're able to do it. Uh, but but watch, and I, you know, I can I can uh, send something to the SIG uh, uh, when we have that available, if that's of general interest, or directly to you. Oh yeah, uh, you're welcome to share with. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean, another thing that is happening is this annual corporate partners meeting mm -hmm. um, is May 15th and 16th. This is just a essentially a one day thing with a reception on the 15th. Um, and you can see the agenda here. Uh, I mean, that's certainly a, a, a way and we're going to advertise Icicle as well um, uh, in, in that. Uh, so we've been doing these corporate partner meetings for years now. So that's certainly another place where you can come find out more about, about these things. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ken and Cindy. I, I look forward to getting on LearnSphere tomorrow. And uh, um, hopefully for topic group three, we can, at least one of our goals can be to get uh, XAPI in there as an import and potentially some transform functions too. Super.